Welcome everyone on behalf of the INALDI Center for International Studies to this year's Lund Critical Debate, Migration in the Age of Pandemics. I'd especially like to welcome Dr. Shujana Jacob, Deputy Director General, World Health Organization, and Senator Bob Menendez, Chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Senator, for your participation in this debate. Thanks also to our moder moderator, Dr. Ganesha Kaur of Wild Cornell Medicine, where she is the director of the Human Rights Impact Lab. And finally, a special thanks to Judith Lund Biggs, class of 57 Arts and Sciences, for establishing, for establishing the Lund Critical Debate Series in 2008, which brings together noted experts in international affairs to discuss issues of world news and policy. Immigration is a topic that touches virtually everyone. Climate change, political instability and upheaval, pandemics, deforestation, ecosystem destruction, and globally transmitted diseases are changing the intensity and the nature of migration. In 2020, there were 281 million migrants across national borders and far more that migrated within a given nation. As a global community, we need to understand how to protect migrants and sustain and stabilize the communities from which they come, as well as those to which they migrate. COVID-19 has exacerbated all of these challenges. Migrations with all its attendant complications was chosen as a grand challenge at Cornell an issue that brings together thinkers from across disciplines. I can think of few more relevant areas of critical inquiry. In 2020, 3.6% uh, of the global population were international migrants. This scale of migration has enormous geopolitical, environmental, and ecosystem health consequences. At the same time, COVID-19 has limited mobility and shut down many borders. And all of this affects the most vulnerable as they seek stability, security, hopefully opportunity, and basic human rights through their migration journeys. Today's symposium is an opportunity to look critically at the complex issues surrounding migration and health from geopolitical, epidemiological, and humanitarian standpoints. Thank you all for being with us today. To introduce our panelists and moderator, I'd like to turn things over to Rachel B.D. Rydell, Director of the Mario and Aldi Center for International Studies, the John S. Knight Professor of International Studies, and Professor in the Departments of Government and Brooks School of Public Policy. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much, Provost Kotlikoff. Today's lunch critical debate is an Anaudi Center signature event. This debate series signifies and demonstrates the spirit of openness and broad perspective taking that defines us. In this moment, we face critical global issues and very different ways of approaching them with multiple perspectives stemming from various experiences and types of expertise. And that is the heart of what the Anaudi Center seeks to foster, productive, generative, open dialogue around difficult issues to contribute to the opportunity for our students and our audiences all around the world today to expand their horizons and take part in these complex conversations. The Anaudi Center is Cornell's hub for global thinking and action, offering regional and thematic programs to promote new ways of understanding people, places, and challenges and opportunities that connect us. We're very pleased to co-sponsor today's Lund debate with Global Cornell's Migrations Initiative, the university's first global grand challenge, and in partnership with the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs with production assistance from eCornell. We're extremely honored to welcome our distinguished keynote speakers today to begin this conversation. Following their remarks and exchange, we will continue the conversation with questions from the audience taken up by Cornell and WHO expert panel. So please submit your questions on the topics throughout the event in the chat function. Now let me introduce our keynote speakers. Dr. Zuzana Jakob serves at the World Health, Org 
World Health Organization's Deputy Director General since 2019, after serving as the WHO's Regional Director for Europe since 2010. She has held numerous international public health policy positions, including serving as founding director of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and as state secretary at the Hungarian Ministry of Health, Social, and Family Affairs. Dr. Jakob was instrumental in the WHO's 2021 report, Refugees and Migrants in Times of COVID-19. Senator Bob Menendez is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and a Democrat representing the state of New Jersey. The son of Cuban immigrants, Senator Menendez has served in the House of Representatives from 1993 to 2006 when he was elected to the US Senate. He has established himself as a domestic and foreign policy leader, seeking to support the most vulnerable in our society and lending a voice to those least able to speak for themselves, both within the US and globally. He has helped to pass key health care legislation, including the Senate's COVID-19 relief packages. Menendez commissioned and led a Senate Foreign Relations Committee investigation that culminated in the 2020 report, Global Forced Migration, the Political Crisis of Our Time. Our moderator today is Dr. Ganesha Kaur, who is the co-leader of Inaudi's Migrations Research Team and an anesthesiologist specializing in human rights research at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Kaur serves as the founding director of the Human Rights Impact Lab and a medical director of the Weill Cornell Center for Human Rights. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion on migration in the age of pandemics. My family came to this country in the 1980s to escape persecution in India. Our story is one typical of refugees. My highly educated parents left their jobs families and possessions trekking their two young children across the world in the pursuit of a better life. We lived in fear of returning to India, but simultaneously experienced racism and bigotry and struggled to find our identity as Americans. We had very little means. In fact, one of my earliest childhood memories is sifting through couch cushions to find change to fill up the gas tank at the end of the month so that my parents could make it to work. Above all, my parents worked hard to provide me and my siblings a pathway forward. Many people here have a story like mine, and that passion for the stories and the rights of migrants is palpable in our national discourse. In this hour together, we hope to provide an outlet for that interest, bringing together experts in health and foreign policy to foster a deeper understanding of migration in the age of pandemics. And as my parents had hoped for me, I hope for us, the creation of a pathway forward. As director of the Human Rights Impact Lab at Weill Cornell Medicine, my work investigates migration trauma and the mitigation or reversal of that trauma in refugees through rigorous scientific methodology. And on the human level, as a physician, I see in my patients that while we cannot change war, violence, or persecution that one experienced before they arrived to our borders, we can change what happens afterwards and either further their traumatization or work towards rehabilitation. The opportunity we have today to advance the rights of migrants is immense. It imposes on us a commitment to bear witness to the atrocities that we see, to use our training and expertise for a cause greater than ourselves and to trailblaze new pathways for documentation, research and solution building. And in the universality of what defines one's human rights, we are not bound by the limits of our jobs. It is possible to be a public servant or a physician and a human rights ally. Accelerating violent global conflict is leading to millions of forcibly displaced individuals globally. National discourse has focused on why people come to this and other developed countries. As a forensic medical evaluator of torture and trauma, I can tell you that people are coming because they can no longer stay home. I recently evaluated a young Nigerian man for asylum who as a Catholic priest was captured and tortured by Boko Haram. His two young sons had been shot and murdered. His youngest daughter was raped and killed in front of him and his oldest daughter had gone missing in the escape efforts. 
he was jobless, stateless, and living in a shelter in New York City. And I can tell you that he left the place, family, and friendships that he loved most in the world for the pursuit of only one thing, freedom. The issue of migration is the issue of our time. Just like issues of segregation and slavery or women's rights and gender discrimination have entered the national discourse and never left, so too will the issues that we are discussing today. But it gives me hope that we are together here. It indicates to me that vulnerable migrants do not stand alone, that there is an entire community behind them, that we here are that community behind them advocating for their human rights. Thank you to our speakers, Senator Menendez and Dr. Jacob for sharing your wisdom, experience and expertise with everyone in the room. I'll start by inviting you to share some opening remarks with our audience. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Gunisha, for inviting us and esteemed Senator Bob Menendez, Mike Kotlikov, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure for me today to be with you for the Lund critical debate on such an actual and relevant topic. The pandemic is a powerful demonstration that everything is at stake when health is at risk. For more than two years, we have witnessed health systems struggling to cope with the aftermath of acute over chronic disease and health. People are missing essential life-saving health services. Children have missed out on immunizations and months of education, and millions have been rushed into poverty. The global economy is still suffering. International human mobility has been drastically reduced with border closures, travel restrictions of unprecedented scale. In addition to a global pandemic, social and economic inequalities have been deepened. But let's go back to the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing challenges for the world's most vulnerable, including refugees and migrants. A global WHO survey of 30,000 migrants and refugees highlighted the lived experiences of this population during the first year of the pandemic. For many migrants, discrimination, stigmatization, lack of financial means, fear of deportation, lack of available health providers, and uncertainty of their entitlements discourage them from seeking health services. The challenges were even more evident for those living in informal and insecure settings. While evidence shows the positive effects of migration in social and economic development, Often public health policies keep limiting the fulfillment of the health needs of migrants and refugees worldwide. During the COVID-19 pandemic, promising practices to increase the availability and accessibility to quality health delivery for refugees and migrants have also emerged. For example, there was a wide range of regularizations so that migrants could have access to health care, and many states showed foresight in breaking down barriers through policy or practice to ensure non discriminatory health care uh, and vaccine access. Unfortunately, many of these solutions were temporary. We need to recognize the ones that were successful and build on them and make them permanent. The COVID-19 pandemic has served as a global case study showing how resilient health systems built from contextualized and evidence-based responses rooted in human rights perspectives and in line with international treaties and agreements are the best way to ensure essential services are delivered to all including the most vulnerable. 
Ladies and gentlemen, WHO engagement has been embedded in the establishment of the WHO Health and Migration Program, aligned with the WHO Global Action Plan on promoting health and refugees and migrants, and coherent with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact for Refugees. We will continue to support member states in addressing the public health aspects of migration by jointly identifying the main challenges and offering regional and in-country support through strategic leadership and commitment. WHO will continue working towards resilient health systems and policies sensitive to refugees and migrant needs. This work must translate into long-term, resilient, and coordinated responses that transcend from acute humanitarian interventions. We will continue to work with partners to support countries to protect and promote the right to health for all people, including migrants and refugees. I thank you and back to you, moderator. Thank you. Senator Menendez, I invite you for your opening comments. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you today, and I want to thank Cornell University for providing this venue to exchange ideas on this critical and timely topic. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Kaur for moderating the discussion and Dr. Yacob for lending her expertise. Uh, as a son of Cuban refugees, I understand the sacrifices millions make in pursuit of safe refuge from life-threatening crises and the need for global solidarity and leadership to force attention and action. In 2020, as was referenced, I released a comprehensive report on global forced migration. It called for urgent and sweeping action by the international community to address the plight of millions of forcibly displaced people worldwide. We know the scale of the current crisis is unprecedented in human history, and if unaddressed, will grow in size and complexity. Today, there are 84 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, the same number of people currently living in the large country of Turkey. The COVID-19 pandemic dramatically compounded vulnerability of displaced people around the world. Millions had already been driven from their homes by violent conflict, climate-related disasters, and rising authoritarianism, which eroded respect for basic human rights. With the onset of the pandemic, many refugees and migrants found it even harder to meet their basic needs by securing jobs and accessing vaccines and healthcare. They were also met with increasing hostility as outsiders by host communities. And too many children and young adults lost access to education services, deepening inequalities and increasing food insecurity among families who depended upon school feeding programs. As a result, many were forced to be on the move again. Conflicts during the pandemic also became entrenched and different approaches that nations states took in addressing the pandemic drove wedges between neighboring countries, increasing tensions when international solidarity was much more needed. In Latin America and the Caribbean, a region that I pay particular uh, close attention to, there have been blatant attempts, for example, by China and Russia to extort countries, offering vaccines in exchange for ships and political alliances. We've also seen China and Russia double down on their support for authoritarian leaders in this hemisphere, strengthening their ties with the Diaz Canal, Maduro, and Ortega regimes. And the recent moves by the Ortega regime to waive visa requirements for Cubans is, for example, a clear signal that Nicaragua intends to use Russia's playbook to instrumentalize migration. 
Over the last year, I worked to secure COVID-19 vaccine donations for our allies in Latin America and the Caribbean. I led congressional efforts to advocate for a capital increase to the Inter-American Development Bank to enable their support for post-pandemic recovery. And I co-sponsored legislation designed to shore up our alliances with critical partners in the region. On a global scale, I co-authored and introduced legislation called the International Pandemic Preparedness and COVID-19 Response Act, which focuses on responding to COVID-19 and better preparing our government to prevent, respond, and detect future pandemics. I have consistently advocated for a principled and effective immigration policy, one that permanently discards the inhumane Trump era policies like the perversely named migrant protection protocols and the Title 42 public health order. Title 42 deprives legitimate asylum seekers of their legal right to seek asylum and pursue their protection claims in the United States. For almost two years now, Title 42 has created unsafe conditions for vulnerable migrants, increased the total number of dangerous border crossings, and prevented the Biden administration from fulfilling its promise to restore access to asylum. Now look, while I recognize the importance of carefully managing cross-border travel to facilitate our nation's pandemic response, now that non-essential travel has resumed at our nation's borders, it's time for the Biden administration to rip off the Band-Aid, end these expulsions, and restore the regular processing of asylum claims. Instead, I'm disappointed that the administration recently expanded its use of Title 42 to expel Venezuelans back to Colombia. Venezuela is suffering a refugee crisis as the result of a brutal dictatorship and urgent humanitarian conditions. Using Title 42 or any authority to expel Venezuelan refugees back to Colombia without any sort of protection screening is unconscionable and it has to stop. I'll continue to urge the president to correct course immediately and we'll call on the Center for Disease Control to phase out the use of this cruel policy immediately as well. The COVID-19 pandemic has also fueled the rise of authoritarianism whose grave human rights violation drive forced migration. These dictators are stifling dissent, demolishing democratic institutions, restricting economic growth and dividing communities. This is um, uh, shockingly evidenced by the Lukashenko regime's trafficking of vulnerable migrants and refugees to the borders of Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia to instigate a political and humanitarian crisis. This weaponization of desperation demonstrated how cynical dictators will stop, stoop to any level to advance their own political interests, even at the suffering of fellow human beings. Ruthless crackdowns against opposition leaders, brutal attacks against peaceful protesters, misinformation campaigns peddling propaganda has been commonplace from Caracas to Khartoum, Damascus uh, to Naypyidaw. We cannot uh, and will not cede space to those who terrorize their citizens to force them in the patterns of migration and, in order to preserve their positions of power. Let me close by saying it's not all doom and gloom. Our allies and partners have taken vital steps over the past few years to fight the pandemic and the United States reversed course uh, over the destructive years of the previous administration in terms of its refugee policies. But more is needed. We must also be clear eyed about the path ahead. I'm pleased uh, uh, and eager to hear more from Dr. Jacob about her thoughts on the role of the world health organization will play in pushing for collaboration and coordination on these topics. And once again, thank you for having me with you. Thank you, Dr. Jakob, for laying the foundation for what migration looks like across the world and the health impact of that migration. And to Senator Menendez for providing a little bit more texture about what people are really experiencing. I think what you've described in your opening comments is sort of how the shape of a of violence experienced by people across the world is changing. 
What we see, for example, in our human rights clinic and research lab at Weill Cornell is that people are fleeing more grotesque or gratuitously violent persecution. So families are experiencing longer stays in refugee camps. Um, we, we see that just the instability associated with the migration journey, such as lack of access to school, lack of access to healthcare, the possibility of early child marriage due to financial strain, that that instability itself has detrimental health effects. So thinking about that, how the shape of violence is changing, what can be done to bring some stability amidst this extreme instability? For example, during acute displacement or during the migration journey, or even as people await their asylum decisions within the US and beyond. Well, let me, uh, if I may, also, I'll try to answer that to start. We, we know that many of the traditional uh, international solutions to displacement were based on short-term stays in refugee camps. Um, these are not effective. Today, most forced migrants are unable to return home for decades and do not live in camps, but in cities throughout developing countries and protracted displacement, I think, requires new and innovative responses, which include easing barriers to accessing education, healthcare, and livelihoods. And it also demands support for poor countries who bear a disproportionate responsibility for the forcibly displaced. I think an interesting factoid is that the top 10 refugee hosting countries host 63% of the world's refugees, but they account for just 7% of global GDP. That is a dramatically disproportionate reality for them to face. Enormous pressures on these countries that have already limited resources. And so I think the United States and the rest of the, of the developed world have to join in the responsibility and, and stop uh, uh, tying the backs of displaced immigrants on those countries that then find social pressures uh, in responding to it and then close borders uh, and restrict access to asylum and humanitarian parole. Let me follow up on this, Gunisha, if you agree. Yes, uh, first of all, let me say from the WHO perspective that in order to bring more stability, we need long-term uh, legal and policy frameworks, framework and uh, also an effective implementation of this. Um, within WHO terms, the principle that all people should enjoy the highest standard of health, regardless of race, religion, political belief, economic and social condition, has been affirmed already by the WHO constitution 74 years ago. And this has been captured also later on in the Almata Astana Declaration, and more recently in our pledge to the SDGs. Uh, in the leave no one behind. And these are the principles and also the values that are at the heart of our WHO Global Action Plan for refugees and migrant health. And this was also confirmed by the Global Action Plan at the World Health Assembly by a resolution of 70 slash 15 a couple of years ago. On the one hand, stability is fundamental for the highest attainable physical and mental health. But on the other hand, investing into long-term public health policies and interventions will positively contribute to societal stability as well. And individuals and families, communities, economies, and nations can only thrive when health is protected and promoted. In the case of refugees and migrants, examples of avenues have been integrated both into our global action plans and including also the global compacts. Moving a bit further towards operationalization, within such policy frameworks, there are a series of high-level recommendations and actions that need to be considered and implemented. For example, to incorporate the health needs of migrants in national and local healthcare policies and plans, such as by strengthening capacities for service provision, facilitating affordable and non-discriminatory access, 
reducing communication barriers and training healthcare providers on culturally sensitive uh, service delivery. The drive for universal health coverage with a primary healthcare approach means that all people and communities, irrespective of their social and legal status and background, have access to health services of sufficient quality. Ensuring these services do not expose the user to financial hardship and advances the efforts to bring stability to refugee and migrant populations. Universal health coverage with a primary health care approach is the basis of a stable society and local and global health security. International legal frameworks and their ratification and treaties and accords and agreements and standards can also contribute to stability. And my final point is that unlike for refugees, for migrants, we do not have a specific convention that allows for their protection, often leaving an essential gap between policy and practice. And this is an issue that we have to bear in mind in moving forward, and we have to fill this gap. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Um, you know, you've, you've both mentioned in your comments the reports from your offices that have highlighted understanding the root causes of displacement and, and challenges migrants face along the journey. Um, our migrations lab at Cornell University, for example, has researched ways that public policies such as the Trump administration's public charge rule have posed major challenges to migrants along those journeys, um, causing millions of immigrants of all legal statuses to disenroll from public benefits such as school lunches for children and, and prenatal care for pregnant women. Um, Dr. Jakob, you know, you, you've talked about how, just talked about how health is, is critical to maintain um, and healthcare access is critical. How do you imagine that we can maintain that access um, as, a, as a sanctuary, as a safe space during those turbulent migration journeys? Well, of course, there are many good examples across the world uh, that we have to study, learn from, uh, promote, advance, and also advocate for. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that inter, the, the second issue is that many have considered health as a good connector uh, in the social, economic, and political arenas, a connector of ideas of people, a connector within and across the borders, and interconnectivity of different sectors in health and non-health policies and inter interventions is paramount. Health needs to be included in migration, and migration needs to be integrated into, the health, into health. And policies should translate the right to health into equitable access to health care across all phases of migration and within different settings. This requires a strong coherence between policy, operational, and research stakeholders in the design in the translation and implementation of actions to improve access to health care of migrants and refugees. Refugees and migrants have very specific cultural, linguistic, and health needs. And their health services and the health care providers need to understand and provide to ensure successful delivery of health care for these populations. And I, do, I would like to highlight three practical issues in this regard. First of, first of all, particular attention should be given to the need to maintain a firewall between health service providers and immigration control. Health data should not be used for immigration purposes, and there should therefore be a guarantee of confidentiality. This ensures a high level of trust between the healthcare provider and the refugees and migrants. Secondly, migrants and refugees have to know how to navigate within the health systems, which is the agency that can help them, 
And this needs to be paired with migrant sensitive capacity building within among health professionals and staff. And, addition, and there's an additional component of maintaining the trust within the healthcare provision. And finally, we have to capture the experience of the individuals throughout the migration route and throughout the implementation of the policy. And therefore, we need to have a continuous form of monitoring, evaluation, and implementation of the strategies that we use. Uh, again, this can help us to build the trust. And then we can say that the healthcare is a bridge to building the trust. Of course, we have some good examples, but we have to work very hard to make this happen everywhere with everybody and to build a consensus around these issues. Thank you. And back to you, Bunisha. And that's a sort of beautiful concept that you've, you've proposed here, the idea of a firewall between health and immigration policy. Um, Senator Menendez, you mentioned uh, in, in quite some detail Title 42 to justify blocking migration. Um, and as we, kn we know, this has resulted in younger children crossing the border alone. Um, can you comment on how Title 42 has not just impacted global flows and the border, but also immigrant communities within the US? Well, uh, the continued use of Title 42 has created, in my view, life-threatening conditions for vulnerable <clears throat> migrants. And it has significantly increased the number of dangerous border crossings. Uh, because uh, if, if you believe that you're not going to have a chance to make your case in terms of asylum, uh, then you will seek to cross uh, uh, illegally uh, in a way that then uh, is far more dangerous. Uh, it is neither humane nor effective in managing regional migration patterns. Uh, since the start of the year, there have been well over 6,000 reports of violent attacks against uh, migrants expelled at our southern border, including kidnappings and assaults uh, against children. And that is abhorrent. We have to stop putting vulnerable migrant population in harm's way immediately. Title 42 was meant in a much different way than it is being used. Um, and uh, it undermines our legacy as a nation uh, of refuge and that observes refugee laws uh, and ultimately as a leader globally. And when we do this under Title 42, then we undermine our ability to make the case uh, in a global fashion for other countries to take their responsibilities as it relates to refugees as well. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question. And, and our last question that I'll pose is for this segment is, um, you know, both of your reports talk about how conflict res results in displacement, how climate change results in displacement, and even how climate change can result in conflict, which then perpetuates the cycle. Looking to places like Afghanistan or the US-Mexico border, where the US has itself played a role in sort of creating conflict or crisis, do we then have a greater role or responsibility in managing the resultant human cost? Um, and Senator Menendez, I'd, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Uh, the short answer is absolutely. I, I firmly believe the United States must play a larger role in responding to humanitarian suffering resulting from crisis and conflicts in general. But when, for example, in Afghanistan, we have been part of that conflict, even though we, we may have gone there for all the right reasons. And uh, those who uh, emanated the attacks against the United States on September 11th uh, and what has happened subsequently, but nonetheless, we have been part of that conflict. Uh, and it is important uh, for our country to prioritize the protection and evac evacuation of our partners and allies, of civil society leaders who are trying to make a difference in Afghanistan, women and girls, um, and uh, ethnic minorities affected by, uh, by the conflict, um, as well as by our departure. And, and it is a moral imperative 
that we remain committed to ensuring their safety. That's why uh, I urged uh, the administration to support the creation of a special P2 category, uh, which ultimately is a refugee category to protect Afghans working on the front lines of U.S. efforts to strengthen democracy and human rights abroad. I've urged Secretary Blinken and Secretary Mayorkas to create a humanitarian parole category to protect Afghan women leaders, activists, and human rights defenders. Uh, and I ha have raised the alarms over uh, what I consider an, a, an, a high denial rate um, of uh, uh, potential uh, visas uh, uh, to enter or humanitarian parole to enter the country. Uh, I think that there has to be a, a, a much better set of circumstances. And finally, on the U.S.-Mexico border, look, um, uh, you know, every nation has uh, the right and responsibility to control its borders, to understand who is seeking to enter the country. Uh, but by the same token, unless we get to the root causes, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, both uh, conflict, uh, natural disasters, uh, and, and other human suffering that takes place in Central America, for example, then we will never stop the tide, uh, number one, uh, of uh, uh, undocumented migration. And secondly, um, we will have the challenge of people who have legitimate refugee questions because they are in fear of the loss of their life or their liberty. Uh, and that is the essence of our, our, our asylum laws. So, uh, so yes, we have a more profound role to play, particularly when we are engaged in a conflict or a set of circumstances. Thank you both, Dr. Jacob, Senator Menendez, for sharing your insights. And with that, we will transition to the second part of this discussion and I invite Dr. Riedel back into the conversation. Thank you so much to Dr. Ganesha Kaur and to our excellent keynote speakers for your thoughtful and provoking, thought, thought provoking um, comments and conversation. We're now pleased to be able to take question and answer from the audience. So please do submit your questions that you have for us and we'll continue with our expert panel. Um, Dr. Ganesha Kaur will now serve as a discussant and panelist, and we're joined by Dr. Santino Severoni, who is the Director of the Global Health and Migration Program within the Office of the Deputy Director General at the WHO, where he has held senior positions since 2000. He is a medical doctor, health economist, epidemiologist, and systems management professional. And Dr. Severoni's career in global health includes his role as an international senior technical advisor and executive working for governments, multilateral organizations, NGOs, and foundations in Eastern Africa, the Balkans, Central Asia, and Europe. And in 2019, he was appointed the Euro Special Representative on Health and Migration and Director on Health Systems and Public Health. We're also joined by expert panelist Stephen Yaleir, who is a professor of immigration law practice at Cornell Law School and is counsel at Miller Mayer in Ithaca, New York. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, DC, and co-author of Immigration Law and Procedure, the leading 21 volume immigration law treaties. D Professor Yale received the American Immigration Lawyers Association Edith Lowenstein Award for excellence in the practice of immigration law in 2004. And he is an Anaudi Center faculty fellow in the Migrations Initiative here at Cornell. So thank you all so much for participating in this extended conversation to take up the points that were just raised. And I wanted to start by taking up um, Dr. Jacob's, um, I think very important notion that international human mobility has been dramatically reduced with border closures and pandemic era restrictions. And this we know uh, according to data. And, stigmatization, lack of financial means and available health providers, and many other factors that she mentioned, discourage migrants and asylum seekers from access to necessary health services. And with that, we know that public health policies, best practices are rooted in human health experiences. The data that we have that is made available for us to be able to understand the exact moment that we're in. And part of what makes meeting the needs of vulnerable populations so difficult and so challenging in this moment is that their well-being and their challenges 
are not necessarily known to us in terms of the data that we can collect. Often the data around this pop vulnerable populations is particularly obscured. And one might assume, in fact, it's in direct proportion obscured or made less visible uh, to their vulnerability in legal and social systems. So I'm wondering if you can each speak to this question from your distinct areas of expertise, health and legal um, and foreign policy in thinking about what health data is most needed. What do you see from your perspectives as being most obscured or, or biased in terms of the data that we do have? And, and for Professor Yale Air, what legal protections are already in place in order to try to address this? Uh, and what additional legal frameworks could be better established to address public health for all? Um, Dr. Severoni, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you all for having me with you today. Well, this is a really a, a central uh, issue when we are trying to address the uh, public health uh, concern and actions in order to secure a fair access to services and to the health systems. Um, I would like to dissect a bit uh, your question, try to analyze and better understanding where are the bottlenecks. We need to uh, consider that when we are talking about migration, the health sector have been traditionally on a second line, on a second row in terms of engagement. Health matters have been perceived for very long uh, a matter of side effect of the migratory process. Probably you refer, you alluded to the COVID situation, it was alluded also before. Uh, this was a very painful uh, confirmation of what we are preaching in terms of public health that including and protecting the world population is essential for uh, increasing our health outcomes. In the case of migration, the policies and implementation of policies have been traditional in the hands of other ministers, other, other sector of the, of the government. And uh, usually in case of, uh, of crisis or in, in case of public health concern, a sector used to come in. This has been creating the main, one of the main dysfunctionality. First of all, the um, health sector was not engaging into or participating into shaping up policies. Uh, and uh, as a sort of vicious circle, uh, was not even able to have a, a clear idea of the reality and trends because data were not available or data that were fragmented. Then situation actually is changing. I have to admit that this was the initial picture we uh, observed uh, years ago and uh, things are, are, are changing thanks to God, but still the engagement of the health sector sometimes is not clear or is not timely or is not supported by enough capacity that is needed in order to engage in this area. And certainly this is one of the issues which we are strongly promoting and we are looking after, particularly when we are um, defining the type of support needed at country level. Then it's coming the issue of data. data uh, respond a little bit to, um, how to say, a, a structural uh, dysfunctioning. If we're going to look at the data production of the last decade or two decades, it's impressive to see the amount of data available, research, study on this topic, including health and migration, but on migration in general. The problem where it is that those are research usually uh, triggered by local or uh, case study type of interest. So at, at the end of the story, we are not pos in possession of a single set of data or comparable type of data that we can use for uh, a broader definition of trends or uh, addressing concerns or really having information for shaping up our intervention in a cost-effective manner. In many cases, data or the collection of data is hampered by legal obstacles. In certain countries, by constitution, is not allowed the disaggregation of data by ethnic uh, status. In many countries, the health information system is not yet so developed to be able to capture data related to this complex issue or multifaceted issue like health and migration. 
and also the disaggregation of data by gender, by migratory status, the definition of indicators is still something relatively new. Imagine that only in the SDG, the topic of migration has been uh, brought in in a, in, a, in a systematic manner in the MDG, so in the previous global effort to address poverty, inequity, and uh, development, migration was not there. So for the first time, we are having global indicators that for the SDG, for the uh, development goals that could be disaggregated by migratory status and start to provide those type of comparable data or disaggregated data to better understand the phenomenon. Thank you so much. Professor Yellair, your take. Yeah, we have dear, real data problems when it comes to measuring migrants' health in the United States. You know, viruses don't discriminate on a person's immigration status, and countries should not either. And we need a coordinated response, both within the United States, to fight both viruses and xenophobia and to try to promote public health. You know, all non citizens should receive <clears throat> the same rights to health care as citizens, and non citizens should not be discriminated in that regard. We have lots of problems, and to uh, amplify what Dr. Severoni pointed out, we have structural dysfunction in the United States because we don't have one agency dealing with immigration. If you think about environmental issues, we have the Environmental Protection Agency. If you think about veterans' issues, we have a Veterans Administration. But when it comes to immigration, we have the US State Department and its consular posts. We have the Department of Homeland Security, which has three different immigration agencies within that. We have the Department of Homeland, um, Department of Health and Human Services, which has an Office of Refugee Resettlement. And we have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which does some public health aspects for immigration. We need to combine all those so we would have better data to be able to determine how to deal with immigrants in the United States. Two small examples, detention. Many immigrants are detained when they come into the United States and put into for-profit immigration jails. And we've had a hard time finding out how those immigrants are being treated. Coronavirus ran rampant through many of those immigration detention centers. And Dr. Kaur and I worked on behalf of one physician from Cuba and her problems with coronavirus and ultimately were able to get a story in the New England Journal of Medicine about her travails. But that's only because of she had the powers of Cornell University helping her out. We need better data on how immigrants are treated healthcare wise in immigration detention facilities. And second, um, we need to figure out how to deal with immigrants when it comes to their access to public benefits. Uh, immigrants can get public benefits in the United States, but if they rely too heavily on public benefits, then they can be deported. And where that dividing line is, is very confusing, both for public health experts, as well as for immigrants itself, themselves. So we need to do a better job of educating immigrants and health service providers about what public benefits immigrants can access so we have better data to determine how to help them. Thank you. And Dr. Carr. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think building off of what Dr. Severoni said and sort of amplifying what Professor Yaler has brought out, um, my perspective is really that of a physician, that when I see individual patients, individual asylum seekers, what I know, I know that we are missing the high level data that Dr. Severoni has highlighted. Um, I know that we are missing the data from these private detention centers across the border. But what I'm seeing as a physician is that we are not documenting the individual health issues, those individual impacts of our border policies in the context of this pandemic. So I'll give you a quick example. How does being separated from one's family, place, being placed in immigration detention, not receiving vital health care, how does that impact a child's mental and physical health? And I think those are the data that we are missing um, on that very individual scale. So while we look at the broader viewpoint of, of what do we need on a, on a big data level, how can we actually bring a little bit of the human story into this and see how it's actually impacting people day to day? And what are those long-term effects? What are those long-term impacts? 
we know that, for example, family separation can result in deep psychological trauma when it happens even just on the scale of moments or hours or days. So just because we are able to reunite families doesn't take away that trauma that has been caused. And, and what are the long-term effects of that trauma? That data we have to collect. Absolutely. Thank you so much for those perspectives. Now, I wanted to take up a question from an audience member um, regarding the negotiations surrounding the Russia-Ukraine impasse, and that I think relates to the earlier discussion uh, by Senator Menendez around the potential weaponization of migrants across borders, and the comments around uh, Title 42 that Senator Menendez began. And so more broadly, I was wondering, Professor Yaleir, can you comment on the legal and humanitarian aspects, the implications, for example, that Title 42 has had on global flows and immigrant communities within the US surrounding border closures and, and uh, the difficulties in seeking asylum. And what has the pandemic itself revealed in terms of pre-existing conditions or continuing patterns and what has it changed? And Dr. Kaur, I'm wondering if you can comment on the individual impact that this has had, for example, on children as and their families that you're seeing in medical practice. And, and Dr. Severoni, I'm wondering, moving beyond any specific case of the United States or another region, how do you see these kinds of domestic regulations on borders or mobility um, impact the WHO's work and objectives in terms of the global migration program? Uh, Professor Yaleir, we'll start with you. Sure. So I'll speak from a legal perspective because that's all I know. But as Senator Menendez pointed out, Title 42 refers to a U.S. law that allows the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to bar entry to the United States based on public health concerns. And the Trump administration invoked Title 42 based on COVID-19 pandemic. But the Biden administration is continuing those immediate expulsions. Over 1.5 million people have been expelled under Title 42. Um, numerous groups are challenging Title 42 in federal court, and they claim that under the UN Refugee Convention, which the US is a signatory to, and which we have incorporated into our domestic asylum law, the US cannot legally summarily expel people if they express a fear of persecution. And the UN High Commissioner for refugees has written in a friend of the court brief to uh, this litigation that Title 42 violates both international law and U.S. law, and that other countries have been able to balance uh, public health concerns with their international law obligations by allowing individual assessments of migrants to determine whether they have a fear of persecution and whether they have COVID. The uh, federal appeals court in the Washington DC is considering the case and could rule soon, but no matter what uh, they decide, I'm sure this is gonna go up to the US Supreme Court. The Biden administration has made an exception under Title 42 to allow unaccompanied children to enter the United States, but most people now trying to enter the United States at the US-Mexico land borders are summarily expelled, even though we allow international flights to come in from Mexico. This makes no sense. And I agree with Senator Menendez that we need to get rid of Title 42. Thank you. And Dr. Carr. As Professor Yaler has said, and as, as Senator Menendez also um, said in his discussion, you know, Title 42 results in the separation of families because uh, unaccompanied minors are, are now crossing the border. And so aside from the, the impact on an individual child's physical and mental health, um, you know, you have a situation where, where parent-child relationships are disrupted and negatively impacted. So what is the long-term effect, health effect of that? Again, something we need to investigate. I also think looking at the aftershocks of those kinds of moves within the community, um, within immigrant and migrant communities, but also within our broader U.S. community. For example, what is the trauma that is um, the weight of these kinds of policies on the folks who have to enforce them, such as our own border control professionals? Um, what, what is the impact 
of these policies on, on their physical and mental health. And so I think there, there's a lot more to be investigated here and, and it will start with ending Title 42. Thank you so much, Dr. Severoni. Thank you, Rachel. Well, indeed, the uh, short answer is that indeed the uh, current situation as a, a, the national policies have a direct impact on the health sector and the work we are doing. Actually, we are trying to undo some of, of the of the jumps we are observing at country level and try to offer the option of a rational solution, a rational approach. The uh, focus, and this was alluded by the previous speaker, of most of the totality of the countries around the world on board and management uh, is probably one of the main issues that is then triggering uh, a fallout on the health sector because the focus on board and management need to define people, need to attribute a code to the people which are crossing the border to define them legal refugees, economic migrants, students, uh, and so on. The uh, definition automatically, so the, leg the, 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 the legal framework, which is supporting the definition, automatically define the level of entitlement of access to health assistance. So the, um, the level of access, indeed, what we are observing, if we are scanning the situation worldwide is very different. We have a, a small group of countries which, for a number of reasons, but mostly for a political decision, they believe in a universalistic type of uh, uh, health systems. And in this case, uh, the uh, tendency will be towards including everybody, regardless of the migratory status. This doesn't mean that is not is is uh, is easy in this situation to access to services health services because still you need to navigate the system the system need to be resilient to uh, to to be able to address flexible to address the needs of the entire population including migrants refugees or or asylum seekers but then the larger part of countries they tend to have a midway solution where they tend to grant certain basic services and that's it and then a group of countries with a conservative approach, they tend to uh, offer only emergency type of care. And uh, what's very interesting during COVID, just to give another example of how the national policy are influencing the health response, we, during the initial phase of the uh, pandemic, we went to analyzing the uh, policy setting of all countries around the world, vis-a-vis -vis inclusion or not of migrants and refugees into the COVID response policies that the country they were putting in place. And it's very interesting, again, a small portion of countries, about 30%, they understood that we were recommending a pure public health approach. So the inclusiveness as a public health roots and justification in order to be effective in uh, addressing the uh, pandemic uh, concerns. And they did that. They basically waive any restrictions, any legal limitation and they provided to all population full entitlement, full access to any services. What was the learning story there? That no one of those countries went in bankrupt, which is usually the argument utilized by health sectors or politicians in the health sectors to put a limit in the access to service for those which they don't have entitlement. Then interestingly, the majority of the country again choose a midway solution with temporary exceptions in order to address the COVID response, but not really intending to um, change the country policy setting or uh, legal framework setting. So this means that the situation will revert to what was before or previously to COVID. And again, there is always the hard part of the group of countries which believe in into keeping population separated and distinguishing who has a right, who has not rights, uh, with a, a consequence that all, all of us, uh, we know. Absolutely. Thank you so much to each of you for your perspectives and to all of our distinguished panelists for sharing your expertise, your knowledge. I think that together you've really set the stakes for how we can best address public health, 
for all members of our global community, particularly in times of, of challenge uh, such as this pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Lund Critical Debate. Thank you.